you got to have all three to make it work. And, you know, you got to have the right clients, the right people, and then the right mindset. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. If you haven't already gotten access to our free 60-minute firm owner masterclass, head on over to smartpracticemethod.com to discover how to spend less time chasing clients, trying to round up money, hiring and firing employees, and put your firm on autopilot so you can do what you want and really have it roll over to every other area of life. And now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. Here Architect Nation, since you're a podcast listener, I know that you're always looking to fill up your empty space in your day with valuable ways to sharpen your sword as an architect or sharpen the saw, as Stephen R. Covey said. I wanted to tell you about Detailed, which is a podcast series run by RCAT that features architects, engineers, builders, and manufacturers where they share their insight and expertise as they highlight complex, interesting, and odd building conditions that they've encountered and the ingenuity it took to solve them. It's hosted by Sharice Lakeside, otherwise known as CSI Kraken, who's a senior specification writer at RDH Building Science. She uncovers lessons learned to help you navigate similar challenges that may arise in your projects. You can listen now by heading over to rcat.com forward slash podcast. That's A-R-C-A-T dot com forward slash podcast or search your favorite podcast app for detailed by rcat today we're joined by jeff frames the owner of frame architecture owner and founder and jeff has been a member and is of the smart practice gone through it implemented the strategies techniques uh, although he had a long career before he ever found smart practice and was very successful before then jeff welcome here to the business of architecture podcast thank you good glad to be here yeah, so let's 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 dive right in. Tell, give us a little background here, a little four one one. Why architecture? What what was for you? What was the genesis here that that told you that architecture is the thing for Jeff? You know, I think it goes back to when I was a young kid. I always liked watching. I always liked watching buildings under construction, and it was just kind of one of those things. It's like, man, that's pretty cool, you know. And and the thought of, well, who thought of that? And you know, it's like you see the the, the crew out there building away, but you're like, well, who thought of that before they started building? And so I was, uh, um, I was, a, I'm going to geek out a little bit on you here, but I was a sophomore in high school. My high school English class, I actually wrote a term paper on architecture. Um, wow, I wish really? I, could, I, w- I mm. wish I could find it. I'd, I'd, wow. I'd realize how much I didn't know. But, uh, you know, and, and one time my parents, my uh, my mom and my stepdad, they went away sometime in, in, when I was in high school. I was probably like a freshman or something. And they came back and my mom had this book. I mean, it was obviously from the 60s or early 70s. It was it, it was just called Architecture. And I've still got it to this day. It's, oh, it's wow. On, it's on my bookshelf. But it was kind of like... It was, it was the thing that got got me going, and uh, you know I did the typical stuff in in high school. I took the you know the drafting classes and all that, and uh, yeah, and it just it kind of went from there. It, there was really no plan B. It was uh, you know, plan plan A took a little bit longer to 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 realize and come to fruition than than most, but there was no plan B. Okay, and tell me about that. Longer to come to fruition. What do you mean? Well, when I was in high school, I. Uh, I really wasn't. Uh, I really wasn't interested in going to high school a whole lot. So I, I, I mean, <laughs> who look, is? I, Let's face it. Yeah, <laughs> look, I graduated on time in high school, and I, uh, you know, I, I was right at the line where you know there was an upper third and a lower two thirds. I was right there at the at the you know at that break there. So I wasn't a stellar student. I, you know, I like I said, some classes interested me, and and some I could just be honest, care less about. And so when I got out of high school, I really wasn't ready for the whole college uh, experience. And I knew I just I probably wasn't going to make it. I actually went to a technical school. So I grew up in Carson City, Nevada, a town at that time about, I don't know, 30, 32,000 people back in 1983. And I went to a trade school in uh, in Arizona, in Phoenix, Arizona, um, just to learn drafting, just to learn how to architectural draft and, and draw and, you know, really understand i mean this is back in the hand drawing days so you know when you drew something you drew a line every line had a meaning and so um i went down there i left within a week after graduating high school so this is june i moved from carson city kind of somewhat hot very dry arid climate to phoenix arizona to 
really hot and a surprisingly humid climate at times down there. And so I was, uh, it was kind of shocking. I did it within seven days of graduating high school. I, within a week, I'd moved down there and started in their summer program. And it was an every night thing. It was night class. I went from like six to 1030 at night or something like that. And it was just, it was just architectural drafting. And then I think the last third of it or the last six months of the course were, it was basically when CAD was just starting out. I mean, it was just, it was, it was rudimentary back then. It was it was bad. I, I still have this this backup tape that's you know it's one of those old tapes. It's probably about eight nine inches in diameter. I've still got it. It's in a box in my garage, and it's just you know I, I doubt there's anything around that can even read it anymore. But it's uh, wow, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm I'm sure you know I'm sure it holds next to nothing on it. So just because yeah. of the storage capability, but two hundred fifty six kilobytes, if that, right? And and it was just I don't know. And I I. Uh, I came back to Reno after about 18 months, and I, I actually got a job drafting um, for a uh, for a mechanical engineer. Um, they they needed some help. They just got a CAD system, and uh, this was like oh, this was the first of the year, 1985. And like I said, they just got a CAD system. We got going on that, but you know, we were working with a lot of architects, but I was, you know, drafting ductwork and plumbing and all this stuff. And it, it was all right, you know, worked with a great bunch of guys and, and people and, but it really wasn't what I wanted to do. So in that I had a chance to meet quite a few architects and, and one day I kind of inquired that, Hey, if you're hiring, you know, I like to, I'm more interested in architecture than I am in mechanical engineering. And they picked me up. Uh, and then I got busy in that. It was a one-man shop. Um, so there was he, and it was just he and I for the longest time, about three years. And so we got to do a little bit of everything, smaller projects. And that's when I realized that I was about 20, 21, 22. After about three, four years, I realized I, if I'm going to do this, I need to get serious about it. So I, uh, I enrolled at, uh, at one of the colleges up here in Reno and, um, you know, took their uh, – uh, it was a two-year program and took as many classes that I could. And then I um, I ended up being, tra I transferred uh, down to, actually down to UNLV. Their architecture program was just getting going. Um, and then I got my bachelor's down there in 1993. And then in uh, I transferred to the University of Utah in the fall of 93 to get my master's. And then I, we, we, I actually graduated uh, in the spring of 96. So by the time I was starting school at 21 or 22, most people were getting out of college. So I was always the oldest when I was in college. I was always, you know, three, four years you know, older than everybody, but I can't really complain. I look where I'm at now and, and, you know, it's just the timing, the timing always seems to work out for the best. And, you know, I just, it, you know, it worked out for me. That's beautiful. I, I remember back in school, there's there's always like those two to three students who are a little bit later in their life that are coming back, they're going through school. You're you're this young kid, 19. I was this young kid, you know, whatever, going through school. And uh, they were they were the mature ones. They were the ones that were like, you could just tell they were like serious about school. And everyone yeah. else is like, man, we're just partying and, you know, hanging out and drinking a lot and just well, being wild. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was me. I mean, there was no, well, I mean, by the time I started in school up here in Reno, about a year later, I ended up getting married. So, you know, there was no, there was no frat life or anything like that. I mean, it was like, you know, and, you know, I, I drug my wife, Michelle to, you know, I drug her from her home here in Reno to, to Vegas and the Salt Lake and then, you know, eventually back. But it, uh, yeah, it, it was, uh, it was an interesting time. It was, uh, you know, it was difficult. Um, both of us were going to school full time you know, working and, uh, you know, I worked my whole way through when I was in architecture school. So there was, there was that balance. Uh, the advantage to that is, is I got out of school and I was debt free. I didn't know any, in, no student mm -hmm. loans or anything like that. So, you know, at least from there, I didn't start off with, you know, a huge pile of debt going into, you know, at that time, a profession that let's face it in the mid nineties, didn't pay first year, first year people very well. Absolutely. So, well, all right, let's talk about how did you make the leap to starting your own practice? Uh, so I was working for, a, I came back to Reno in 1996, right after graduation. It was summer, about August of 96. I was working for a firm. Um, you know, there's, you know, Enoch, there's, there's, I think anybody can look back at their career and go, there's milestones everywhere and there's really three places four places that I worked that are that are milestones of my career one was um you know one was the the first person I worked for in Vegas he he taught me he taught me that that architecture was a business and it was to be profitable and so one of the things I learned from him early on and the people I worked for in Salt Lake were all about historical preservation and the, you know the the 
the, you know, kind of the, the history of architecture and the buildings. And, 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 you know, that was something that's always held dear to my heart. And when I moved back to Reno, I went to work for a firm that um, it, was, uh, it was made up of two partners. And then there was four, about four more of us. And they had taken over from, uh, from the founding partner. And they were just kind of riding his coattails. And they didn't do any marketing at all. They, they, they were doing a bunch of school work out here in the rural areas in eastern Nevada. And, you know, they would, they would never go out there and meet the school board. They would never, you know, the, the work just kept coming in. They didn't have to do anything for it, you know. So they get middle schools and high schools and all these different buildings and everything. And well, one day, you know, there's an election and the school board changes. And all of a sudden now you don't have the same client. And the people who got elected had been marketed quite heavily by another architect. And all of a sudden all the work started going to them, you know, and they missed and they just didn't uh, put the effort in. And, you know, I'd see them every day at lunch and they would just eat lunch in and they would, you know, they would never get out and meet anybody. And, you know, here we were, it was 98 97 summer of 97 everybody in this town's busy there's you know, this is back in the days you know there were you know architects would post help wanted ads in the in the newspaper and i remember one day there's eight help wanted ads in the newspaper for local architectural firms various you know positions and that same day my boss came to me and said hey you know we're kind of slow we're going to cut down everybody down to 32 hours a week and i thought you got to be kidding me like what are these guys doing that you're not so I, I, uh, I went home that night and, uh, put my resume together and then on my lunch hours and the days that I wasn't working, I would go out and put my resume all around town. And one day this guy called me and, uh, he said, Hey, got your resume. And, uh, actually, no, I dropped it off to him at lunchtime and it was kind of empty in there. And I was kind of standing at the front lobby and I didn't, and I, I was kind of looking around the corner. I could hear some shuffling of papers. Finally, I, you know, nobody was up front. I just finally walked around to where I heard the news, the the noise. And, and I walked up to him. I said, hey, uh, he goes, oh, nobody out front. I said, well, it's kind of lunchtime. Yeah, nobody's here. So I go, oh, yeah, they all kind of leave around here. He was laughing. He says, what you got? I said, well, I'm here just to drop off a resume. He says, oh, yeah, we're looking for a, a person. He says, hey, come on in, sit down. And I talked with him for about 15 minutes. He says, all right. He says, where are you working now? And I, I told him, he says, he looked at me, he smiled. He says, yeah, they're kind of dry, aren't they? <laughs> I, thought, I thought, yeah, okay, you know, all right, I could work for this guy, you know. And so I uh, I couldn't help but laugh. I, I mean, it's been 25 years since he told me that. I still remember it. So a couple of days later, um, you know, his partner and one of the other people there called me. I went in for an interview and, uh, you know, accepted the job, you know, right there on the spot and it was just uh went went in gave my two week notice and you know and you know the guys that I worked for were mad but it was just like hey you guys aren't doing anything you know and all these other guys in town are hiring and uh, mm. you know a few years later those guys ended up breaking up you know and so it was a it was a great thing so I was working for these guys this this firm um great firm did a lot of great work a lot of public works projects we worked on some amazing projects and but I always felt like I was kind of on the outside looking in where they had a lot of guys, they had a handful of people there who had been there 25, 30 years and they were doing the same thing that they were, had been doing probably from day one. And that just wasn't me. I, so one day I got a call um, from another architect here in town who uh, got my name from somebody. Anyway, he says, Hey, would like to talk to you. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm happy where I'm at, you know, and I was, I was doing this really cool project in downtown Reno, this historic preservation project. And, uh, and so I, I said, yeah, I'm not really interested. He said, well, you know, why don't you just come talk to us? And, and I'm like, yeah. So about a week or so later, I figured, well, I'll come talk to you, you know, why not? And so I go talk to him and, you know, it, it, you know how it goes. It's, it's the niceties. And then all of a sudden it's like, all right, what's it going to take? You know, cause that's mm. really what it is. It's, it's, uh, and I'm like, look, I, you know, I really like him. I like the projects I'm working on. And so, you know, so I threw a number out there and he goes, okay, we'll pay mm. you that. And I'm like, oh boy. And that number was 50% more than what I was making at the time. Oh, wow. wow. I mean, yes. yeah, yep. I mean, I, look, mm -hmm. I was swinging mm -hmm. for the fence and, you know, there mm -hmm. were things that I wanted to do. I mean, we, we were, we, um, by then our son had been born and I think my, yeah, my wife was pregnant with our, our, our daughter. So, you know, there was, uh, you know, I knew she was going to quit working here. And so I'm like, you know, we were going to be a single income family. And, you know, we were, I was getting the itch as an architect to build my own house. And, you know, I was starting to look around at land and all that. So I'm like, huh, okay, you know, here's what it would take. Well, I ended up turning him down. 
Um, oh, wow. I was work I was working on this project and I just couldn't do it. And uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I had to see it through. But I went to my boss at the time and I met all at that time what was now all three of them and I said, Hey, I'm gonna tell you guys what happened because it's a small town up here and I, uh, I, I, you know, and they said, all right, you turned down a 50% increase in pay to stay here. I said, yeah, I did. I said, I would like to see from you where you think I'm, where you see me. And, and they were like, well, what do you want? And I pointed to the window with their three names on it. And I said, I want my name on that window. That's mm. what I want. And, and I'm going to have it one day. And they said, all right, let's, okay, give us some time. And I said, all right. I said, I, you know, I'm, I can't leave this project. I just, I told him, I said, that, you know, I like you guys. I said, but you know, I gotta, I gotta watch out for me. So, you know, they're like, all right, give us a chance to talk about it. I said, okay. Six months go by, not a word from him and got down to the end of the project finishing up. And, you know, we'd done the grand opening and the, all the press and everything out. And a couple of nights later at my house, I get a call from the guy I turned down six months before. And he says, same offer still on the table. And I said, I'll take it. I mean, it was kind of message to me that I wasn't going to move up anywhere in the firm I was at. And so it was, you know, it was, you know, I was going to have to fight and scrape for every pay increase. And Mm -hmm. so I took it and, you know, the old expression, the grass isn't greener on the other side. It wasn't. And it was the catalyst to separate me to start my own firm. About eight months later, I was out on my own. It was just, it, it wasn't a good fit where I went. It was, in fact, it was awful. I was under a lot of stress. and But I ended up meeting, uh, you know, meeting a lot of private developers and commercial realtors in town. And that's how I started out. I kind of quit and went right back to them and told them I was out on my own. And they're like, well, we were using you anyway. So we'll just, you know, when you were working for this guy, so we'll just keep using you. So, and that's kind of how it started. You know, it started out very small. I was in a uh, about 196 square foot office in, um, in, in, and at that time was a sketchy part of town. It's now a trendy, you know, part of town that's being redeveloped. So anyway, that's how it all started. Beautiful. That's how ago. it started. How, how long ago? 20, it's, it, it was 20 years ago. Um, it was 20 years ago, uh, uh, just about two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. It was our 20th beautiful. anniversary. Yeah. So what are you what are you seeing right now? Let's let's update me with current events. Let's jump just jump way back. Let's jump way forward right now to the present. Uh, we had a short conversation before now. What you're seeing in the economy and what developers are doing and some slowdown in housing. Give me the lay of the land. Well, I think you know I, I, the production home builders are are kind of slowing down. You know, a few of them have stopped. Uh, you know, any future phases here or any you know up here in northern Nevada, what we have is you know we're we're, the county I live in is still 88% owned by the federal government. So, you, you know, we don't, that gives us only 12% of the land to develop. Now, there is a, a quite a significant lands bill that will do some land swaps here in the state of Nevada, um, public land for, for some other stuff. And so we're hoping that goes through to kind of free up, uh, you know, free up some more land here for development. We are still under a huge housing crunch here in northern Nevada. Um you know, housing prices are high. Rents are ridiculously high. Um, we just, uh, you know, we just need, you know, companies are still moving in. Uh, you know, Nevada's got a very favorable business tax climate. And so companies are realizing it. They're coming in. Tesla, who put their, you know, Tesla Panasonic put their battery factory out just east of here. Uh, they're going to triple the size of that building um, to for more components. So, you know, we're seeing more more pressure on infrastructure, more pressure on on you know on our schools, and and more pressure on just more housing pressure. Um, you know, we we continue to see more more, especially more multifamily housing starting up. What we're seeing now is is developers are building you know, new houses for rent versus new houses for, for purchased given, you know, given the interest rates or, you know, mortgage rates are, you know, somewhere around 7%. So we're still seeing it. We're seeing, um, we're still seeing companies move forward. Uh, recently we've signed quite a bit of, quite a few contracts for, you know, for new commercial projects. Um, so we're seeing it, but the dynamics are changing as far as the, you know, the companies that are coming in retail is still, Retail, I say, is still a little soft, um, you know, so you're seeing like these big retail centers get repositioned into, you know, they're, they're just different uses. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of athletic uses, a lot of gymnasium uses, a lot of fitness centers, if you will. Uh, we see retail centers um, have a lot of, you know, urgent cares and medical office buildings and dental offices being put in there. So a little bit different uh, dynamics, but 
you know, we are seeing those done. So, you know, we're all looking up here. I'm not really worried about it, you know, this year. And, you know, we're, pers- you know, our company, we're, we're on a pretty aggressive hiring campaign right now. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, tell, tell me about, um, tell me about like, so we, we had a conversation, you were down here for a design council event and we kind of went over mm-hmm. this idea of the different phases of an architecture for a motor, right? Going from kind of the solo guy who's hustling and grinding and then hiring those employees and then you're really directing the team, meaning that everyone's coming through you and then elevating past that to the, 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 like a leadership position where you're, you're not necessarily directing people, but you're leading them, which is a, a key distinction. And we talked about how you're like kind of on that cusp, kind of that transition mm-hmm. part. You have some team members who are for a long time, you've directed the firm, meaning you're, you're in the mix with them. You're operating, you know, you're, you're doing the work. You're like everything, a lot of stuff's going through you and you're making that transition now to being more of a leader. Tell me about that. Tell me some of your challenges and learnings up, uh, going through this process here? Well, uh, we're, we're in a, you know, right now we're at eight people, seven or eight people, and we're in a tough spot management wise. It, it's, uh, you know, I'm, it, it, it's tough to direct and, and all those people. And so, you know, I feel like I'm just bouncing back and forth between them all the time. And, and it leads to a lot of stress and, you know, and, and so some of them depend upon their personality types, take it a little bit more personally than they should. But I've had a, I've had about, I've had about, especially three people really step up into that leadership role recently, which has just been awesome, you know, to where they're now teaming up and leading with with the other people in in the office. So it's more about it's it's more about me kind of setting the the vision and procuring new work more than than it is, you know, being involved in the day to day operations of of every project. I'm still. You know, to this day, I'm, there's still projects that I'm running that um, none of the other staff is touching just because we just don't have enough. That's not ideal. Um, you know, it, it's uh, I want to pass those projects on, but it just, you know, they're overloaded right now. But it is nice having people who who are now mentoring the other people in the office. And, and so we're really we're kind of on that in between right now where it's 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 not running as smoothly as I like it, but it's running smoother than it was even about six months ago. So it, it is, you, you really have to, you really have to kind of cast that vision to the people and, and they really have to, and you hope they grab it and buy in. And, and it's been, it's been kind of tough, but it's been, you know, it, it's, it's nice when I talk to them one-on-one because they can really, really understand kind of what I'm going through. It's, I find that, you know, when we're in staff meetings or something like that, everybody just kind of clams up because they're waiting for, you know, they're waiting for the guy to speak, right? They're waiting for me to dictate what's supposed to be going on. And it's just like, I don't want that. But I realize that I got to get them away from the office one-on-one. They really open up and I, it, they, like I said, three of them are really, they've kind of accepted the empowering, you know, emphasis I've, I've, I've given them over the last, the last year. How do you cast the vision as the firm owner? You talked about that. What does that look like in your world? Oh, it, it I, I thought it would be an easy thing when we actually, when mm, we first started. It sounds out here. so easy, right? It's, it sounds really easy, you know, work with you guys when you come up with the summit map and the vision and all that. It's like, okay, here it is, buy into it. And it's, you have to live it and you have to, you know, if I'm going to put it out there, you know, that I'm really interested in every single person's growth in this company. And I'm interested in, you know, not just their professional growth, but, you know, their personal lives as much as an employer can be as well. You know, you, you, ha- you can't just say it, you know, and you can't, you know, you can't just say it in a Monday morning staff meeting and then dump on a Monday afternoon with new projects and start screaming at them with, with, uh, you know, deadlines and stuff. And, you know, there's times that, that, um, you know, you, you got to, as the, as, as the owner and the leader, you, you got to accept the responsibility of, uh, of, of, Hey, the client's not happy. And sometimes I got to take it on the chin and, and don't sacrifice my employees, you know, uh, because, you know, I, I've worked for guys who, who would throw us under the bus all the time. And, you know, I didn't work there very long. So, you know, I realized that that's just not the thing to do and, and really just try to help bring them up. And, you know, everybody's different in their own personality and, and the own way you have to deal with them. So you have to really, you kind of have to, you know, walk the walk if you're going to, if you're going to throw it out there. And so, you know, when I told them all, it's like, Hey, this isn't about me. This is about us. I'm not building this company for me. I'm building this company for who's leading it next. You know, so I'm looking for that 
that person or those people who want to step up and really lead it. And so we put those we put those roadmaps in front of all of them of what this looks like. And you know, of, of the three people that that I'm really looking at right now, all three of them are in different positions as far as you know licensing and and uh, and and whatnot and what they can and can't do. And so. You know, it's, um, I don't know if those three are, are it to, you know, they may or they may not be, there may be somebody coming in from the outside, who knows, and then really involving them in the process and the decision making. So it's just not, it's just not me dictating everything out. So right now, when we hire people, one of the things we do is, is, uh, is we have, I mean, I interview them, of course, but then I also have a couple of my staff members interview people just to see if, uh, it, without me there, I want to see, you know, do you think they're a good fit? Do you think they really have it? Because, you know, every, so people will tell me something and they'll tell, they'll tell, you know, our staff something else. So you're kind of, you know, it's involving them in everything. Right now I've got one employee, I've got her, uh, you know, writing proposals and, and uh, you know, she always goes over it with me. She says, well, what do you think about the fee? And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, it might be too much. And then, and then she gets the contract signed and I'm going like, well, taught, taught the old man a lesson there. You know? There you go. I love that. Yes. <laughs> and, I, and I told her, I says, Hey, you taught me a lesson that we should be charging more. And, uh, you know, good for you that, uh, you went out and you went out and got the extra money and it's, you know, and it's, you know, it's that premium fees call, right. You know, and it's just like, you know, we are worth more and we need to, you know, you know, we need to up the game. And so, you know, there's been a couple that I thought, nah, we won't get it because of the fee, you know, maybe that's a little too much. And here we go. We got the project. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, good for them. And, you know, it kind of gives them uh, just more confidence. Mm. Isn't it one of the firms that I work for in, in Houston? I remember when I interviewed for that position, it was a small practice. There was basically three full-time employees plus the owner. They rented a small, nice little house that he'd refurbished in typical architect style. The wooden floors, the vaulted ceiling that had been, you know, remodeled, and, uh -huh. and just just a perfect architectural space, right? And as part of the interview process, they brought me back and they sat me down back in the drafting area at an empty table, and they just left me there for 15 minutes. When I say left me, the owner was in the next room, kind of working on some stuff, and he just let me sit there. And what I realized later, as as this happened to other people, is that that was an important part of the interview process, mm. was putting me back with the staff, where the staff could talk to me. Because with a team that small, it's like, if you don't like this guy, we're not going to hire him. You know, it's, right. there's got to be some energy here. There's got to be some, do you guys like him? And so that's what Blair would do is like, he'd come back later and he'd say, okay, so what'd you all think about this guy? Is he a keeper or not? Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> should yeah. we get, should we, should we cast him back into the ocean where he came from? Or should we, uh, should we bring him up on deck? <laughs> <laughs> we had, we had one that, uh, I knew he had the skill set. He came heavily recommended from a, a colleague of mine, but I was kind of like the personality. I don't know if it's here. And so mm. I set him up to interview with, two of the other people and uh they came back and 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 i said well you know what you think and they said well as long as he works at home and never comes in the office he'll probably be okay <laughs> <laughs> and i said well he he yeah. he said he wants to be in the office you know which is of course nowadays you got the whole you know working remotely thing going on um yep. but yeah it, it's just i said well i, I guess it's not going to work then huh? and they're like no way in the world and so yeah. i you know I shot him an email saying hey best of luck you know it's just yep. uh I mean, his skill set was there, um, mm -hmm. you know, which is, of course, you know, the number one thing we all look for. But realistically now, the number one thing is, you know, what's the chemistry like? 100%. Yeah. Now, an important part of leadership, of course, is knowing when someone's not fit and being able to let them go, being able to having to fire them, right? Tell me mm -hmm. about your approach here. Uh, do it right away. Just, yeah. you know what, rip the Band-Aid off and do it. It's, it's... um it's not enjoyable. It's, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we just, in fact, we just recently had to do it. It's, uh, somebody was still within their, their 60 day probationary period and they just weren't a good fit and really didn't have all the skill set that the, you know, they said they did and the resume did. And so, um, it just wasn't working. It just wasn't a good fit. And I just called them into a, a private room in our office and, and, and that's basically the way I put it. I said, Hey, look, it's uh, you know, you're frustrated. We're frustrated. It's not a good fit. Uh, I'm, you know, we're going to, your, your final check will be deposited in your account tonight and I need you to leave right now. And, and it's, it's, um, you can't get emotional with it. You know, you just, as a leader, you just gotta, you know, you just gotta kind of, you just gotta do it. And w once it's done, it's this air of relief in your office that all of a sudden, you know, 
everybody else realizes, all right, he's, he's, everybody knows we need people and we need bodies and we need help, but yet there's not at that price, you know, and and we've had to do it a, a bit in the last year where we've had some extremely talented people that were just really caustic in the environment. And, um, you know, I just had to, I had to cut them loose. I mean, I had to cut two of them loose last July within a week where they were, they were working on two of our biggest projects and it really put us in a bind, but it was so bad in the office that it, I had no choice. And, you know, we all had to jump in and cover for them and including myself. And, you know, here we are almost a year later, we made it through just fine. So it, it really, what we found is one, when we do that, and when you get rid of just bad fits, everybody else seems to fill in. And I see, I just see our people grow immensely at that time because they, they realize that, Hey, when, even though I'm technically captaining the ship here, I'm taking everybody else's opinions, you know, into account in, in the direction I steer. So I've really seen, a, there's a couple in particular in my office in, in the last few months of just, i say the last six months of just immense growth in, in design and working with clients and just ability to just expand, you know, their skill set. And so you really kind of go, that's what I'm here for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, one thing that, um, you know, obviously running any business is, is important to have a profit. Your firm has been highly profitable. At the same time, you guys also focus a lot on what we might call, you know, high, uh, good design, right? Mm-hmm. So you're not just churning and burning projects out there. You're really, you're really taking care to make sure that there's something distinctive about the design, that it's unique, that it, that it, that it has synergy, you know, everything we learn in design school. So you kind of, you kind of live in the best of both worlds, right? Profitable doing good design. Yeah. Uh, it, it's yeah. still a firm, so it's not like it's not like easy street. But for mm-hmm. you, what, what are some of the keys to running a profitable practice? Because there's so many out there, especially small firms where, you know, they say they're not in it for the money and you look at the, the books and you're like, well, I can see obviously that that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> um, first and foremost, I have great people. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, we're, I'm I'm nothing without the people that, that, that I get to work with every day and I get to, I, I get to work, you know, it's just, uh, um, they're, they're, they're all unique in what they bring. And you, know, you sound I, like a high S here. Of them that are just, Jeff, I love it. Well, I know, I know, I know. I got to get back to the D in me, but anyway, <laughs> I, I've got two, two that are just, two that are just amazing and create creative you know, creatively amazing in in their design. And it's fun to work together with them on projects and, and to see and to let them kind of take control uh, of the project. And so I, I think, yeah, first and foremost, you got to have people around you to, to get profitable. You know, you, you, you know, when I was working by myself, when I was a sole practitioner, you know, slugging away, I, I'm, I, I made a decent living, no two ways about it, but I did fine, but I didn't make a profit you know, it was, uh, you know, there's only so much one can do. And really the idea is, is, you know, I, I'm, I'm not leading people. I'm, I'm, I want to lead leaders, you know, and that's, that's, you know, to kind of multiply that, that effect. So what we've done is, is, you know, is build the team around us. Another thing we've done is, um, is go out and get the right clients, you know, is, is really look for those clients who really want, you know, an upper level of design. I tell people, especially the corporate clients we work with is, it's our job to increase your branding through architecture. You know, the, the architecture is just the product of what we get from you. It's not, hey, we, we don't we don't force any design aesthetic on anybody. And so we get buy-in from our clients that way. And it's, and it's uh, you know, it's charging the right fees. It's, uh, you know, realizing what everybody's worth and what we're worth and, and, you know, and convincing the client that, you know, and it takes a little bit of work to convince the client that, hey, here's the effort and time put into it. And then first and foremost, once we get a project and we budget it, you know, we, we take that 15% right off the top. So we don't, we don't hope that we make a profit at the end of the project. It's, uh, it's like, hey, you know, if we get a, we get a hundred thousand dollar fee, we got 85,000 to work with. That's our mindset, you know, and sometimes we do better than that. Yeah. Sometimes we go over, you know, and, uh, you know, but that's, that's the goal right away. And so you, you give, you know, we work on the budgets together, give everybody, it's like, Hey, here's, you know, it's easy to break down when you got a, you, you got a dollar amount for a fee and you, you know, you, you take out all the consultant fees and that's, here's the architectural part left. And so, here's what we got to go with. And so it, it, you put that framework in, in motion and the, and the employees buy into it and, you know, they work towards it. 
Mm. Cause they know yep. at the end, they know at the end of the year, you know, you know, at the end of the year, I, I do year end bonuses. I know there's a lot of people that do quarterly and half year bonuses. And we're thinking about the half year thing and, you know, and maybe, but you know, last year we had our best year ever, um, both gross and net revenues and my employees, um, my employees bonuses ranged anywhere from 22 to 28% of their yearly salary last year. So yeah, they, they knew and they've all you? told me, well, it actually felt great for me that I could do it for them because I, mm. you know, you know, when you hire somebody, you know, their, their life is now your life, right? And you know, you know, every single thing they're going through, you know, you, you know, their rent payment or their house payment is now your house payment. And, you know, their, mm -hmm. their, uh, you know, their family issues and their kid issues are now your issues, you know, and, and that's just, that's the way it is. So, you know, everything that every employee is going through, you know, and, some of them it, it touched a little bit more than others and 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 that's that was the intention so it felt good to me to be able to do that um you know and that's really the drive is like okay let's see if let's let's do that again this year you know let's let's make it you know we pay them a pretty we pay them a pretty good wage already but let's see if we can we can give them a little bit more you know and so that's that's you know that's the drive is to really get it for them i mean i could have easily gone out and bought another car right you know could bought one of those really nice new whatever Tesla's or whatever at 125 grand or hundred, whatever, you know, I took that money and divided it up amongst the employees and said, here you go, have fun, you know? And, and, uh, so I think they understand the buy-in that I'm willing to give and, and, you know, and reward them for. What are you finding some of the other benefits of having abundance of money in the practice? So you talked about being able to give amazing bonuses to people. That's mm -hmm. incredible. What else, Jeff, what else opens up in your world or how does this roll into your personal life? What's the impact of having an architectural practice where there's an abundance of cash and you're not, you're not breaking even or, or wondering where the next, how you're going to pay the next bill. <laughs> well, I, I mean, you know, it's, it, it, you know, we're, we're able to become more involved in the community as well. You know, we, we spent a lot of money last year just on uh, different community organizations sponsoring whatever their benefits were. Um, you, you know, the, every community organization has a, you know, nonprofit has a fundraising event every year. You know, and we were able to step up to the plate and be, you know, corporate sponsors for a couple of them, you know, which was nice. And uh, it's it's fun to do. You know, it's it's nice to see what goes on in your community and, and to be a part of that. So that that, of course, is is a big thing. Um, you don't really you know, on the financial side, you don't really worry about making payroll every, you know, every pay period for the most part. I mean, it's still like you still got to pay the bills. Don't don't take this wrong here. But it's like. I don't, you know, I, I mean, payrolls, I, I don't know, it's like next Friday or something. I don't do payroll in my office. I, I it, It's out. I, I delegate that out. But, you know, every other Friday, the team gets paid. I'm not worried about them getting paid. You know, I mean, yeah, I look at the books and I look at the numbers and, and all that. But, you know, I'm not worried about when, when an expense comes up in the office and we want to do some. Or if we want to do something extra, you know, I don't, you know, I know that we've got the funds to do it. If we want to have a, you know, we want to have an employee day up at Lake Tahoe. Okay, schedule the day. Just tell me when it is. And all right, I'll, you know, we'll pay for whatever it needs to be paid for. So it's, it's kind of gives them a little bit more of that. Um, another thing we do for our employees is we pay a hundred percent of their, of their insurance premiums. Um, so, you know, for our, my employees, uh, whatever, whatever the health is, health and dental, we pay a hundred percent. Now they pay whatever dependents they have, but you know, most of my colleagues, they pay 50% of, of their employees health and, and dental premium. So it's kind of like, you know, I, I just, it, it's kind of one of those things. It's it's like, hey, you don't have to worry about that. We're you know, and and we absorb we absorb the rate increases. I mean, there for about three years in a row, the, those rate increases were twenty five, twenty six percent a year. You know, and it's wow. just like, yeah, wow. we absorb that. You know, and it's just like, you know, and, but I let them know. I said, look, guys, we're going to absorb this, but here's how much it is, and here's what we need to do. So yeah, it's it's a good thing. It's uh, you know, it, it's not that money is is first, but, but profit, you know, it profit has to be first, you know, the employees are first in my mind and, and taking care of them and their growth. But in order to do that, we have to turn a strong profit in order to turn a strong profit. We need projects where our clients buy in to the architecture and it, it all goes into one. You can't, you, you got to have all three to make it work. And, you know, you got to have the right clients, the right people, and then the right mindset. Jeff, so going forward, 
Well, let, let's back up just a second. You, when you came to work with us here at Smart Practice Business of Architecture, let's face it, you already had you already had a highly highly profitable successful practice. Mm-hmm. What made you want to reach out and engage with you know a, a business consultant like us when you already had? You've already been running a firm for a long time. Well, I did. I, I had a pretty good profit margin before I before I started working with Business of Architecture. What I didn't have is I didn't have a clear vision and a clear a clear way to build a company culture. I didn't have a clear understanding of just how important, you know, you, how important the people around me were. I had people around me. I didn't have the people I have around me like I have now. Mm. Um, you know, I would say in the last, in the last, what, two and a half years, I've been working with business of architecture. I, I only one of the employees has been with me since then. Um, you know, the, the other five or six are all brand new and it's given me a different perspective on, on how to hire and what to look for. I still got lessons to learn there as we all know, but I, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're getting better. It's also company culture and, uh, and really the, you know, really broadcasting and presenting that vision. Also, you know, the metrics and, and, you know, recording everything and, and really, really delegating all that out. I, I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants, you know. It's kind of like I, I look at the at the bank account every month and go, "Hey, we still got money. We must be doing pretty good," you know. We were doing good, but it was like we weren't tracking anything. We we were tracking absolutely nothing, you know. And and it wasn't until really started working with you and 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 everybody there and your team is just like, "All right, there's there's a reason here. Hold on." And so. You know, it's been painful to kind of, for, especially for the high D in me, to have to write all that, you know, fill all that out. But, you know, I've delegated that out to my admin person uh, in some aspects. And, you know, so it, it kind of gives me a better framework. And, and now I know what to concentrate on. You know, before it was just, okay, what's the fire of the day? Okay, this client's unhappy. All right, let's appease them. Oh, we got to go out and, and get some new work. Okay, now it's like, wait a minute, let's structure this out a little bit more to where, I now have time, you know, structured on my calendar. I know this sounds really simple, but I now put down, okay, make calls every day or work with, you know, reach out to these people, you know, a couple people a day. And so there's been a concerted effort there. Do I do it every day? Of course not. You know, unfortunately things happen, but it is there and I'm, you know, and now more work is coming in because of it. And it's, the type of work we want because now I've identified the clients that we want to go out and get and we're approaching them. So it's not, I'm not waiting for the phone to ring anymore. It's more the, the marketing and the efforts are intentional. Beautiful, beautiful. Love it. Well, I think it's just, you know, it's, it's important to have, I mean, especially, you know, I've been approached by other business coaches in the past and I've, I've kind of turned them all down, but then to have you guys who, you know, you're all architects, you've all been in the field for years and you all know, you know what we go through, <laughs> you know, we, we kind of, uh, you know, the ups and the downs and the, the, the valleys and the, and, and, and the yeah. peaks. And, and it's just, you know, it, it's been rewarding for me to, you know, to have somebody, you know, Somebody like questioning me pretty hard, you know, and I mean, you're, you're a master at it, Enoch, you know, it's like, you know, why, why am I holding on to these people? Like, well, who hired them and who keeps them here? Yeah, I guess I do. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. you know, but it's, it's like somebody, you, you need that when you're a business owner, because when you're in, in the trenches, you kind of lose sight, you know, at times of, of really how to drive this thing. And it's so easy just to get in the trenches and it's easy just to say, oh, it's not getting done. You know, I'll do it. Forget it. You know, and that's the wrong approach. And that's where I lose. I kind of get off, get off the track and get off lesson here is, is when I just kind of dive and say, you know, what, I'll just do it. And whereas, you know, so it's really helped me all around. You know, we schedule things a whole lot better now. Um, you know, it used to be, you know, I'd, I'd give the standard architect answer to a prospective client, right? When they ask, well, when can you start? I'll have something for you in two weeks. We all say that, right? Knowing full well, we are lying, right? We don't say that anymore. You know, I, first of all, my staff doesn't let me give deadlines anymore anyway. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, I turn to them, I says, where do you think we're at? You know, it, it, knowing full well, we're probably about, you know, three plus months out, you know, and they're they're about right there. So it's just... Uh, you know, it's, it's really just been, it's been awesome. And it's been, you know, it learned a whole lot. And, uh, you know, some of the lessons have been painful, but you, you got to go through it. 
Jeff, you said you're hiring right now. So what position are you hiring for and where can someone go to find out more if they're, they're interested in applying and looking for opportunity to work with we your are, amazing firm? We are looking right now for a, uh, we're calling it a second in command. We are looking for somebody who can manage all the project managers. Um, we are, uh, right now, we've just gone through the process of, of working um, on the job description. We are now starting the video sales uh, portion of it. Um, they're free to go, you know, email anything, email a resume and whatnot to info at framearchitecture.com. Um, you know, but we are looking for somebody, they've got to have a lot of experience. We're looking for somebody like 15 years of experience in the architectural field, at least three plus in managing projects of over 5 million. Uh, you know, so we're looking for somebody who can manage other people. Um, mm -hmm. it kind mm -hmm. of, there's a, there's an opening in our firm between me and the staff and it's, it's, it, it will, it will free me of answering the kind of the daily um just the the daily uh issues that, that, that go through the office so really looking for somebody to come in and and be the number two um advancement is there you know if, if they want to if they want to become principal or partner that that's that's open so beautiful, we're looking for that beautiful. we're also looking for uh we're also looking for some for some production type people to uh to come on board we're uh um, it's just, uh, we've got, you know, we've got a guy in, in the office right now who's, uh, who, who wants to mentor some, some younger people. So we're, we're looking, you know, we're looking strongly for those as well. Okay. Well, Jeff, thank you for joining us here today yeah. on the business of architecture podcast. It's been great speaking with you. I appreciate it. Good talking to you as well. And that's a wrap. And now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. Hey, Architect Nation, since you're a podcast listener, I know that you're always looking to fill up your empty space in your day with valuable ways to sharpen your sword as an architect or sharpen the saw, as Stephen R. Covey said. I wanted to tell you about Detailed, which is a podcast series run by RCAT that features architects, engineers, builders, and manufacturers where they share their insight and expertise as they highlight complex, interesting, and odd building conditions that they've encountered and the ingenuity it took to solve them. It's hosted by Sharice Lakeside, otherwise known as CSI Kraken, who's a senior specification writer, RDH Building Science. She uncovers lessons learned to help you navigate similar challenges that may arise in your projects. You can listen now by heading over to rcat.com forward slash podcast. That's A-R-C-A-T dot com forward slash podcast or search your favorite podcast app for detailed by rcat the views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and i make no representation promise guarantee pledge warranty contract bond or commitment except to help you conquer the world carpe diem